The season in which we now find ourselves, this season of the church's year, is called Ordinary Time. And it is characterized by a return to simplicity and normalcy, as well as by the color green, signifying springtime or new growth and new life. However, this time doesn't exist simply to fill the gap, to fill the gap until Lent and Easter arrive, but rather it is to allow what was previously experienced during Christmas, experienced in a very concentrated form, to be unpacked slowly, yet actively over time, to allow the seed that was planted to unfold, flower, and come to full fruition. Liturgically, what is being unpacked is the incarnation in the nativity, by witnessing the fullness of divine revelation through Christ's call to repentance, his teachings, and his healings each week, to bring us to new life through a deeper understanding in relationship with him. But what we experience in our church calendar also is experienced in our natural calendar for many people. This season often is a time of unpacking some other things, like that weight or those bad habits that we accumulated over last year, and particularly during the winter. Coming to a new life by resolving to live more healthy or better lives in relationship to others. But there's a third way in which the events over the last weeks and the last months are being unpacked. In the wake of Christmas, we celebrate numerous funerals. For some reason, the end of the year sees a larger than average number of people departing from this world. Therefore, many of our parishioners are experiencing a recent loss, or perhaps the anniversary of a loss, or maybe even the, this new realization that there is an empty seat around the dinner table, especially around the holidays. As we get back to normal, how is this reality being unpacked in their lives? How is it that they are going to come to a new understanding of life, especially as they are burdened by this tremendous amount of sorrow? Our gospel today, one that I have read more than a few times these past weeks at funerals, comes from the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is, in fact, the seed planted early in his ministry that will then unfold throughout his life. More particularly, the part that we read today is called the Beatitudes because of this litany of blessed are they. This word blessed, however, is better translated as happy. Happy are they. But what follows in each verse is not often associated with happiness. Happy are they who are poor. Happy are they who hunger and thirst. Happy are they who are insulted. Happy are they who are persecuted, who are lied against. Happy are they who mourn. This scripture passage introduces a paradox, juxtaposing or bringing together two seemingly contradictory sentiments, joy and sorrow. Perhaps that's what makes it such an appropriate reading at a funeral for somebody who has just suffered the loss of a loved one, for someone who finds themselves in that juxtaposition as they experience tremendous sorrow and loneliness, surrounded by a season that is meant to be characterized by joy and togetherness. This scripture passage also brings about two other realities that so often we understand in opposition to one another. This is one of the few, if not the only, reading that the church allows not only at a funeral, but also at a wedding. Now, there might be some wise guys out there who can offer witty remarks as to the similarities between these two events, a wedding and a funeral. <laughs> but for most of us, these two events couldn't be farther apart. But perhaps they are closer together, even more united than we think. The connection is found in the vows that a bride and a groom make to one another, vows that are made until death do them part. You see, the death of one spouse brings about the end of one marriage so that they can begin a new marriage. Or to put it more accurately, it brings about the completion or the perfection of one marriage as it finds its fulfillment in another. 
Throughout scripture, God reveals himself as the bridegroom and we, the church, as his bride. Heaven, therefore, our ultimate end, is nothing more nor nothing less than the consummation of this marriage, a marriage between God and us, entering into that supreme and everlasting moment of joy. Earthly marriages, then, are a preparation, a prefiguration. They are a practice before the big game. They're a dress rehearsal before opening night. They are the cocktail hour before the banquet. They are a foreshadowing, a foretaste of a much greater reality to come, a reality that not even death can part. So th these Beatitudes, our scripture passage today, introduces this paradox. It introduces this juxtaposing or this bringing together of two seemingly contradictory sentiments and events. Sorrow and funerals on the one hand, joy and wedding on the other. Because on this side of that thin veil, that thin veil that separates this world from the next, we are experiencing one. But on that side of the veil, they're experiencing the other. You see, in Jesus, the two are made one. Joy and sorrow, funerals and weddings, heaven and earth, time and eternity, God and man, life and death. This understanding of marriage, I've come to find out, is oftentimes presented as a new insight to people, an insight that their marriage is not an end in itself but rather the means or the vehicle to come to a greater reality, to come to an even greater and more intimate relationship. But that understanding is not just for some future time. It's also meant to shine light on the present. You see, the primary responsibility of a spouse is not just to make their other spouse happy in the moment, happy for just a time but rather their primary responsibility is to prepare them for happiness for all time, for all of eternity, to present them in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish, to the one for whom they have been made. So all those opportunities in which your spouse frustrates you, providing opportunities for you to grow in virtue, to grow in holiness, perhaps they're actually doing their job. We're either saints or saint makers. At one time or the other, we are probably both. But maybe a word to those who are in difficult marriages, those who have experienced separation or divorce. This responsibility still belongs to you, and perhaps even more so, because you have an opportunity in which to be more united with Christ, Christ whose bride, us, his wayward bride, who betrayed him, who denied him, who scourged him, and even, and even put him up to death. For us, for us, his wayward bride, how does he respond? He responds with forgiveness, even offering his life. So those who find themselves in difficult marriages still have the responsibility of sanctifying their other spouse, their husband or their bride until death, following in the footsteps of Christ who is that perfect example of a bridegroom. But for all of us, including those who are not married, while preeminently this relationship is, or this responsibility is given to spouses, it is also extended to all people in all of our friendships, for those of teachers, for those of pastors or parents. We too are called to participate in this responsibility, leading our loved ones to love himself, and perhaps even handing them over to the one who first handed them to us. You see, it's only in Christ that these paradoxes are placated, that these contradictions find clarity. It's only in Christ that any of this even makes a bit of sense. It's only in Christ that we can find somebody who is under the burden of such sorrow and still say, happy are they.